Hi. <clears throat> that all makes me sound a lot more interesting than I probably am. Um, but thanks for having me here. This is my sixth WordCamp, and it's the sixth WordCamp I've spoken at because um, my uh, accountant told me I could only use it as a tax write-off if I spoke at them. So <laughs> thanks. Um, every WordCamp I've spoken at, um, I've got a little bit of a tradition. It started at my first one in Cebu, and I know that there's at least two people um, here today that were in Cebu. Um, and I'm hoping that you all can help me keep this tradition going before we get started. Um, but I just need to check whether you're up for it. So um, is everyone okay with helping me keep this tradition started? Yeah? OK. Um, I promise you, you'll see it on Twitter later. Um, so can everyone who is able to put their hands in the air? Cool. That's most of you. Excellent. Can everyone who is able to stand up for me? Right, so um, we're going to try all of that together now. So I want you to sit back down, and I want you to stand up and put your hands in the air. So ready? On three, we're going to go one, two, three. Stand up and put your hands in the air. All right, so I, we know that everyone can do that now. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a wave, all right? And we're going to start over here. On the, are you guys up for it over here? I need, some, I need some positivity, like shout, yes? Yes. OK, so um, it's a competition, in case you didn't know to see who does the best wave. So far, Cebu is still winning. Um, Brisbane came close. Can WordCamp US do a better wave? Yeah. Yes? All right. I'm going to count you in. I'm going to have to step away from the microphone because I'm going to video this from here. So are we ready? Yeah? Are we going to go both ways or just one way? Both. So we're going to go back again when we get to this end, all right? All right. You ready? I don't know, I think, I think that might be the best one yet. What do you reckon, Ross? Yeah? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joe. in case you didn't hear the intro a little bit earlier and you just snuck in at the end and are like, what is going on right now? Um, I do come from Australia. Um, there are three Australian speakers today, so I am the final in your lineup of Australian programming for this event, um, which is wild. I'm not sure why they thought that was a good idea. Have you met us? We're crazy. Um, my job uh, is to create websites, mainly for organizations that have lots of different users of different types. So I work primarily with nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations, um, a lot of charities and stuff like that. A lot of people who have maybe 10 or 15 different avatars that are coming to their website. And that's why information architecture is the thing that I'm super passionate about and really excited to share with you today. I do speak on information architecture a lot outside of WordPress. This is, I think, the first time I've done it inside of WordPress. So I'm really excited to be able to share with you all some of the things um, from a user experience perspective that I've learned. But before we get started, I want to get a bit of an idea now that you know who I am, who you are. So um, if you can let me know, uh, are you mainly working in content? So like creating or curating stuff people consume. And it's OK if you put your hand up for more than one of these. So who's our like, content people? Yes, love that. We need you. What about design and user interface? So making things people see. Yeah? Perfect. All right. And then we've got um, user experience. Cool. My people. Love it. Um, what about people who are developers, who are building stuff that people use? Yeah? Building stuff that people build with. Love that. And anyone else? So like SEO, hosting, like. Yeah, all right, there's always some, right? And I'm like, you don't know where you fit. That's you. Congratulations. Um, you've got your own box. Um, so <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about some terms today that might not be familiar to everyone. So I'm going to try and explain them as I go. But please do hold on to those questions and write them down if you've got them at the end. Um, and just a reminder, if you do have questions at the end, please jump up to a microphone. 
um, because we had a session yesterday and there was no microphone and I'm really hard of hearing, especially after the Pride party last night where it was really loud. So um, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, oh, hang on, went too far. What is information architecture? Well, I didn't come up with these definitions. Uh, these were come up with by the Institute of Information Architecture that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it's two things. It's the structural design of information and it's the art and the science, and it is both, of organizing and labeling to support two main things, usability and findability. Um, I'm gonna extend a little bit on these terms and also on some other terms um, very soon so that we're all on the same page. But I wanna clarify, if there's nothing else that you take away from today, information architecture is not just navigation menus. It's not just sitemaps. This is what people think of when they think of information architecture. Oh yeah, information architecture is my navigation menu and maybe my sitemap. That is part of information architecture, absolutely. But it's definitely not all of information architecture, and it might not even be the most important part of information architecture for your personal use case, especially for people like developers who are in the room. So what are those key terms that we've got? Well, language is important. Let's make sure that we all understand what I'm saying. Um, so the first one is findability, right? And findability, in a nutshell, is how easy is it when people are looking for something and they know what they're looking for to find that thing? Pretty straightforward, right? So if I go to Google and I search for um, pants with pockets, because God knows we need to search for them, women, um, then, you know, that's, if I find what I need easily, that's good findability. Pretty straightforward, yeah? We all good with that one? Cool, all right. The next one is discoverability. Kind of similar, but not, right? So if we think back to findability, that's all about finding things that we know we need, but we don't always know what we need, right? And our users don't always know what they need. Sometimes we need to kind of shove it in front of them. So that's where discoverability comes in uh, and it's about how easy it is for a user to just kind of come across the thing that they need. So think about contextual navigation menus. Think about related products. Maybe not quite to the level that Amazon throws them in our faces, but like related products can be really helpful. Related posts can be really helpful. So all of those things that allow us to um, sort of continue finding useful information, that's discoverability. And then the last one is a term called information sent that I might use a little bit. And essentially information sent is how likely or how confident is the user that the link or the interaction that they're about to make is going to solve their problem. If I click on this um, other items link in the menu, and we've all seen it, we've all seen the menu that's got other or uh, a non, uh, like uh, miscellaneous or more, right? It's terrible, it's got no information sent because people don't know what that is going to show them, so they're less likely to click on it. So they're the three things we wanna keep at the top of our minds while we're talking about information architecture. Cool? I'm gonna assume cool. Um, so, uh, we're gonna talk about something called card sorting, and for anyone who has done even a little bit of user experience training or anything like that, you might be familiar with this process. It is probably the one that is the most common and the thing that people are already doing whether they know it or not. So I'm gonna give you like a super quick run through of how uh, this actually works, right? So if you haven't heard of card sorting before, it pretty much is like a three-step process. So the first step is to brainstorm and get all of your chunks on a page. Now I specifically use the term chunks and not content or pages or sections or whatever because at this point in time, we don't know what they are. We don't know whether we're gonna have an entire page for team or whether we're just going to have a section on an about page for team, and that's fine. It's okay, right? Our goal is to get all of our chunks on a page. You might not know whether or not a chunk is required. Put it on the page anyway, because that's phase two, and if you haven't played, planned for phase two, when you're doing phase one, you are going to have a hard time later down the track. So when we are doing our brainstorm, the key thing here is there are no wrong answers, get everything on the page, duplicates are fine, don't worry about it, because our next step is going to be sanity checking everything. So 
we're going to get a little bit ruthless here, right? We're going to audit all of that content that we've got on the page. We're going to remove duplicates or combine them together. We're going to make notes on things and say, is this label the right label? Are news and posts and blog the same thing? Um, what are the people who are using this website actually looking for? Because it's very common for people who work in WordPress to say tags or posts and assume everyone knows what that means. Even the word blog is not something that's universally understood, for example, in older generations. Are they looking for news? They're not going to click on blog if they don't know what that means. So this is where we get a little bit ruthless and we start to kind of sanity check and throw out things that don't belong. Look for gaps. What are users looking for that's not already on there? Is it that we've called it something different? And then the last step, and this is the bit where the sorting and card sorting comes in, so we've got the cards, now we have to sort them, um, is to put stuff into groups, right? And then I get asked two questions, uh, how many groups and how many things in a group? And the answer is yes. Um, so there, in, there are no rules at this point in time, okay? The goal is to understand how users associate different terms in terms of information sent. What are they gonna group it in to find the thing that they want? So you don't need to group it into a set number of things at the moment. Your goal in this process is to understand how all of your information is related to each other. Now, there is actually another step on this that everyone should be doing and nobody is, and it's called tree testing. And it's where you actually take the data that you collect from card sorting um, and then you uh, kind of look at statistically where are things gonna make the most sense and what is the overlap and that helps you decide how many groups you should have. There's no you should always have six or you know, this many is too many or whatever. Like a lot of those things have been debunked. The idea of having everything has to be findable within three clicks is a myth. There is absolutely no data to support it. So the answer to this is it depends on your use case. There's no right or wrong answer here. So tree testing is a really interesting thing to do, but I could do a whole session on that and we don't have time to get into it today. So I'm gonna skip on to what that might look like. And it's mess, it's a dog's breakfast, uh, as we like to say. So um, this might not look very organized or useful, but that was after 10 people had gone through the card sorting process of what do those groups look like. We did it old school, because this was pre-COVID, um, and just grouped things. And this is what we ended up with at the end of that as our actual groups. So they make lots of sense, but all of those chunks fit really comfortably into one of those groups. Here's another example of what it looks like. Um, so this is where uh, we did one for a local government, um, for a website specifically for people who wanted to invest in that local government area. And um, it's the town of Victoria Park, if anyone wants to stalk it and look at my pretty map. Um, you'll notice that there's two navigation menus here. They actually had less content than what the other site did, but two navigation menus made a lot of sense because they had two key user avatars. The main one that they were targeting, which was people who are looking to invest in the town, and then also people who already had invested in the town and just landed there because their main website was pretty mediocre, and everything that they searched for to do with investment on Google came to that website as well. So all of this stuff for them is sort of in that secondary navigation bar at the top there. Um, as well as things that maybe aren't part of the primary user flow for the primary avatar. So yay, we've got a sitemap, we've got a navigation, we've done it all, job done, yeah? Yeah, not, not quite? All right, so um, there's a really, Awesome article by a lady named Jen Cardello. I probably am saying that wrong. Sorry, Jen, I've never met you, but um, I love your article. Uh, she works at the Nielsen Norman Group, and um, if you haven't ever heard of them or read anything that they write and you're interested in information architecture, skip the rest of my talk. Just go sit outside and look through their blog. Um, it's um, the, the article that she wrote is titled The Difference Between Information Architecture and Navigation. And she posited that information architecture involves five activities, and we've only done three of those. So we've done the content inventory, yeah? We've, we've looked at what all of our chunks are. We've done the auditing, we've got a little bit ruthless, we've gone through and worked out where the gaps are, what things maybe we don't need, um, how, whether our labels are correct, and we've done the information grouping. What we haven't done are these two things, taxonomy development and descriptive information creation. 
And these are the things that if they're not done are going to cause every single software engineer, every single database analyst, every researcher, every WordPress developer, um, and even every WordPress administrator to cry if they're not done correctly, right? Because we've all been there where we've given a custom, well, maybe we haven't all been there, but I've definitely been there where I've given a customer a website and then I've come back a year later and I don't think I even need to tell you what they've done with it. Um, but they've, they had eight pages when I gave it to them and some, some, they were like, oh, we might do some other stuff in the future and I get it back and they've got 100 pages and they're all top level and there's no hierarchy and there's no grouping and they've got a more item in their menu that has 11 other things in it because they ran out of space on the page, right? So how do we avoid that? <laughs> Because I think we can all agree that that is not an ideal situation to be in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this term taxonomy because it's used a lot in user experience and information architecture in that space. And it doesn't mean what WordPress developers use taxonomy for, which can be very confusing. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about taxonomies and why they're important and how they fit into the greater story of information architecture in WordPress. And in a nutshell, this is what taxonomy means. It's the scientific process of, of classifying things. It's a, it's a system of ordering stuff, which makes sense in the way that we use it, right? But a lot of things that information architects and user experience specialists refer to as a taxonomy aren't what we think of. We think of a taxonomy as a thing, but a taxonomy is a system, right? So that can be really confusing for WordPress users and WordPress developers when they go and start researching information architecture. So it's something I wanted to just point out here. So in practice, particularly in WordPress, we kind of have two ways of creating a taxonomy. We have types of content and we have groups of content. So does anyone know what I mean by types of content? Just shout out like if you've got some ideas of what a type of content might be. Custom post type, yeah, absolutely. Static pages are a type of content, like articles, right? Events, forms, users are a type of content. Downloadable resources. These things are types of content. In WordPress, generally speaking, types of content are gonna be custom post types or post types in general. Not always, but generally speaking, this is gonna be the case. And then we have groups of content, which is what we call taxonomies. And the two that you're most familiar with, if you use WordPress at all, is categories and tags. They're the two built-in taxonomies into WordPress. One of them is a hierarchical taxonomy, so that means that it can have parents. And typically, a hierarchical taxonomy like that, you'll have a limited number of them, and you'll try not to let them get too out of hand. And then you'll have something that's an unhierarchical taxonomy in WordPress, like tags and go nuts. You can, you can use more tags, it's fine. Um, won't be mad. Um, but in short, what these two things are, are relationships. All of this stuff is relationships about how does my content relate to my other content. And relationships are really what we're after here because remember the goal of information architecture and user experience is good usability good findability, good discoverability. And if we don't have good relationships, how are we going to achieve that? So <clears throat> a resource library, let's take that as an example, right? Do users need to be able to filter by resource type? Like, is it an article or is it a checklist, right? Do they need to be able to filter by date? Maybe they want to see how recent it is. I know um, that's something we're challenged with in the Learn team at the moment is like, how do we make sure that we're presenting the most recent information to people? Because it's often going to be the most useful. Um, who uploaded it? Maybe you want to only read stuff by certain people that you know have the expertise that you're looking for. All of that stuff seems handy, right? So you can use these things on maybe a resource library, but potentially you also want to use those same things across your posts in your blog, right? So then we start to think about how do our taxonomies apply outside of where we originally created them. And in, in this case, we're talking about the WordPress taxonomies so that we can have cross-linking of things. So this is where we're going to start to look into how this actually works. 
um, and how we can level up our processes so that we can take advantage of WordPress so that instead of having this, we can go to something a little bit more orderly. So I mentioned that we did this project um, pre-COVID when we were back still using sticky notes, which is a great way to get people to interact with you, and I still recommend it for brainstorms with large groups. Um, but if you haven't found it before, Miro is a great tool that lets you do the same thing online, and then you don't have to type out all the sticky notes afterwards. Um, so here is actually all of the sticky notes. Oh, it's actually not all of the sticky notes. There were about three times as many of this. Just imagine that this is a real example. Um, it's a cut down real example, and this whole process took over a day to do um, of the first one before we tested it. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use something like the, if you are using Miro or another tool like that, there's usually a bulk mode where you can do your brainstorming, and then you go through all of your regular processes, those three that we started with, right? Getting your stuff on the page, auditing your content, and then grouping it. And once we've done that, we're going to start looking at how many of those bits of content are we going to have? And how related are they to other things? So some examples that I've got on here is team members is about 50, right? They had about 50 team members in this organization, but they changed almost weekly. They had huge turnover because a lot of them were volunteer um, or they were on contract. So that's something where immediately we want to start thinking about how is that going to impact how we create that type of content in WordPress? Because I certainly don't want to be going in and editing a page every single time I need to update a team member. And we've all probably seen that where you go into someone's back end and they've got a page called about and they've got a list of 50 team members, but it's not in a post type or anything. It's just like a block on the page. And that's really limiting because it means that only people who can access pages can update that. Uh, it's hard to give them access just to one page and not all of the pages. So if I've got my HR people updating the team members, I also don't want them updating the about page because that's not their job, right? So by separating out our content, we can start to make better decisions and make things more maintainable. We also want to think about what direction the the relationship goes in for stuff that is linked. So the key things that you're looking for here are how often does it change? How many of those types of content do I have? Will that number grow? Uh, and if the answer is yes, then you probably want a custom post type for it. And more importantly, how is it connected to all of the other content, if at all? Right? So how do we do that? Tip two. We color code things. Because like, I don't know if you've noticed or not, I quite like color. Um, so here is the color coding that we use. Now, I'm not sure if it's obvious on the screen there. There are actually two different oranges. Um, but And that's not actually the colors that we use in Miro, but it looks pretty on my slides. Um, so we use the same color for standard pages and child pages. So child pages just being you know, something that has a parent page in WordPress. We use a different color for custom post types or custom content types, right? Uh, we use one color for hierarchical taxonomies like categories and a different color for non-hierarchical taxonomies like tags. We also have sections on there because we don't want to forget about that content that doesn't quite have its own page, you know? Maybe we just want to display this on the About page or on a Services page or something like that. So we're going to color code that as well so we don't lose it. And then we're going to have um, two things that we're going to treat a little bit differently. We're going to have our archive pages. And this is something that is uh, a, term, a term that's thrown around in WordPress that uh, I've found when I've been teaching WordPress to people who are beginners isn't well understood. So if there are any beginners in the room, an archive page is essentially a page on WordPress that displays a group of content based on some kind of condition. Right? So an example of that is your blog page. Your blog page displays all of the posts in the post post type, right? But a, a, um, a tag page might also be an example of an archive page. So a page where you're showing all of the items that have been associated with a specific tag, right? So that's what we mean by um, dynamic page or archive page. It's something that the content doesn't actually live on that page. The content lives somewhere else, and it's essentially just grouping and displaying a bunch of that content. And then lastly, we have landing pages. 
And <laughs> landing pages are great uh, until you go and start cleaning up all of the landing pages that have been created without your knowledge and you realize that's why you've now got 100 instead of eight pages on your website. Um, they haven't been accounted for, they're not being maintained. Uh, we deal with landing pages separately. We actually put them in their own custom post type that's exactly the same as pages, but just called landing pages so that we don't have to deal with them within our regular pages. Um, and then you've also got external links because there's gonna be some content you don't have control over. Uh, that you're going to want to link out. And we want to make sure that we're also working out how that links in with our own content. So what does that look like when we apply it? It looks something like this. Very colorful. Not super useful yet. But it's going to be because if we take our sitemap, for example, um, and we apply that color scheme, then we start to get something that is a little bit more useful than what we had before. So what we've done here is we've looked for pages that have content that is similar to other pages. So for example, a service offering, right, might have a description, uh, eligibility criteria to use that service, because this was a nonprofit organization, um, and information on how to access it. And every single service had that stuff. So that's a good way of identifying your custom post types. Do I have lots of pages that have the exact same content on them? Great create some custom, page, uh, custom post types and custom fields there. Um, another thing that we might look for is, um, are things gonna be grouped? So we have team members, and our team members, our, our people page, there's gonna be a headshot of each team member, their position, a link to their LinkedIn profile, and a short bio. But we're also gonna wanna categorize them as employees or volunteers or board members. Right? So that's where we start to look at our taxonomies and how are we going to group those things. Easy, we create a custom taxonomy and we call it team. So this is the, the easiest way I've found to identify custom post types and custom taxonomies is to look for pages with similar layouts and content. That's tip one. And then pages that list multiples of a thing. Right? So if pages list multiples of a thing, that's an archive page. An archive page means you've got a post type of some sort or a taxonomy of some sort to make that happen. So they're a good way of identifying this color coding as you're going. So <clears throat> what we do then is we take those things that were not standard pages or even that were standard pages and we create like a little map of, okay, these are the post types that we're gonna need, these are the taxonomies we're gonna need, these are the pages we're gonna need. And we ignore the pages for now because pages are a pretty standard kind of structure and they're fairly easy to deal with. The ones that are tricky tend to be um, the custom post types. So let's take, for example, programs in this situation. Programs have a two-way relationship with case studies, events, locations, the blog, and advisors. They have a one-way relationship with pricing um, with partners and with frequently asked questions. And then um, they also have a one-way relationship in the other direction with teams. So what that means is that um, on the program page, uh, there's gonna be a link to the partners that are involved with that program, the pricing structure, the frequently asked questions. Um, but on the partner page, it doesn't actually link back to that program. Right? And on the flip side, on the team page, if a team member works on a program, they wanted to um, show the program that they work on on the team members page, but they didn't want to show the team members on the program page, because it's not about the team members, it's about the people that are using the program. So we start to look at these. Here's another example. So we've got advisors here, um, and it looks like a pretty simple kind of structure. Okay, we've got some relationships there. Let's put the two of them on the page together. Remember this page was full of sticky notes before and they were much smaller, so we're still only dealing with a very small portion. And if we then start adding on all of the relationships that we haven't already talked about, you can see it gets real messy real fast, yeah? Does this look helpful to you? No? Yeah, so we realized very quickly when we started doing this process that we needed a better way of describing what our relationships were. We still use this process for each of our post types. We go through and we map out what it's related to, but then we record it in a table, which seems much more sensible, right? So this is an example of what that might look like. And you'll note here that there are two kinds of relationships. There's taxonomies, um, which are used to group content, 
And then there's relationship fields or um, like fields required, information required. And so this is one of the most common questions I get asked when I talk about this in a WordPress context is, how do I show relationships between different post types? And I'm like, don't worry about what it's called, just stick it in the table as a bit of information, because it is, right? What, um, what frequently asked questions are linked to services is just a bit of information. So how you implement that in the WordPress end might be different depending on your use case. It might be a relationship field or something like that that you're using. It could be that taxonomies are actually the best way to achieve, achieve that. But for now, just get it in the table, all right? Tools that we use to implement this from a WordPress perspective, um, we only use two things to create our custom post types, custom fields, custom taxonomies, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we use either pods or ACF Pro. Um, we don't hard code them because we find that from a maintainability perspective, when you're working primarily with nonprofits who have a zero budget, um, not ideal. Uh, we might not be there in two years' time, so someone being able to step in who doesn't know how to develop and just edit those things using a plugin is really useful. Um, but both Pods and ACF Pro allow you to create custom post types, taxonomies, and fields. Um, we really like the customizability of roles and capabilities inside Pods. I think they've done that excellently. I don't know if, um, if our Pods peeps are around still, but um, thank you. And they also have the ability to really easily create custom settings pages, which is another thing that we find super useful. Um, and you can maintain them all without editing code. Um, but you can't go past ACF for really complex custom field rules and relationships and things like that. Like, um, if I want to add a custom field just on one specific um, page, it's a lot easier to do that and manage that using ACF than it is to use pods. So from a WordPress perspective, because I often get asked, what do you use for that? That's what we use. So that kind of leads me to my third and final tip of today, which is to learn the basics. And by basics, I mean everyone's favorite database table. Um, so if you haven't worked outside of WordPress before, you might not realize that the WordPress database is weird. <laughs> like I don't really have a better way of describing it. Um, the idea of a relational database is that things have different tables and you connect them together, but we decided not to go that route, and instead we have one table that stores everything, um, which is super, it's super, we love that. But if you haven't worked with databases before and you don't really know what I'm talking about, or if you have and you've never really thought to dig into the WordPress database tables, I highly recommend that you do it because it will make you a better WordPress builder, a better creator, if you are planning out a navigation or you're planning out a sitemap, even if you're not the one building it, even if your job is UX, if you understand the limitations of WordPress and how that database is actually built, you're going to do it better. You're going to be better at it. So how do you do that if you're not a developer and you don't already know how to go and interrogate a database? Because that's pretty scary for people that aren't developers. Um, well. Here's a fun tool that we like to use. Um, it's called Local WP. So if you aren't a developer and you don't regularly work with a local environment on your computer, you might not have come across this tool before, but anyone can use it. Um, I've had people say to me, oh, I'm not techy enough. I can't, I can't have a local environment on my computer. You literally click download on their website, and then you cr click create site. Like, it could not be easier. Um, you can create a test site. It doesn't need to do anything. It's just going to spin up a completely blank WordPress site, right? You can log into it um, in your browser, so it's not actually putting it on a computer, uh, on the internet. It's just on your computer. But you can go in there and you can um, add whatever it is that you want. You can download plugins. You can do all of that stuff. Um, and then you can go and you can inspect the database and see what the things that you have done look like. So how do you do that? Well. Um, we have this, now I don't know how you meant to say it, but in my head it's adminer because I'm mining the data in there. So I don't know if it's meant to be adminer or adminer, but I'm going to say adminer. We're going to click this little button here when we're running the site. 
And it's going to bring up this scary looking page. If you work regularly with like creating websites, you might notice that it looks quite similar to PHP My Admin. Same, same concept, right? It's allowing you to navigate around the database tables. So when you get here, and if you have not done this before, and you want to take screenshots, go right ahead, but also don't forget that this will be on the internet forever, and you can just go back and rewatch it. Um, so we're going to go first to the WP Posts table, which is where you would expect to see a lot of information. And then we're going to go to Select Data, and that's going to show you the data that's in that table. And then once you've done that, and you're feeling less overwhelmed, then you can click on the one above it that says WP Post Meta, and then call me, and I'll give you a hug. All right? But I, I, I do really think everyone who isn't familiar with the database should at least go and try and learn a little bit about how it works. It's free. It's not going to take you that long. And at least when people say, like, if you're talking to a developer and you're not a developer, and they're like, the problem is that we can't do this because this and this don't talk to each other, you'd be like, all right, I've seen the dog's breakfast. That is the database. And I understand the how can we work together to, to make it like come up with something that's going to be sustainable for both of us. That's going to look the way I want it to look and interact with stuff the way I want it to interact, but also not make my development team cry. So a reminder for everyone that you are not the user. Uh, so I did mention about tree testing being something that I really strongly encourage you to do when you are doing this, um, like this process. And here's the thing, we do all of that in WordPress. We don't use any expensive UX tools. We actually take our navigation menus, for example. Um, we come up, we do a survey uh, of what are the like top 10, top 15, top three, depending on the size of the customer, things that, you, that people want to accomplish. And we try and get them to actually ask users, not ask them directly, because you are not the user. Um, and we get that list of things. We put what we've come up with into just a blank WordPress site, right? Um, you can even do it on local WP. And then we send them the link and we say, OK, find the things that you need. And we don't even put the content in there at that point. We just put like a little, we've just got a button block that when you click it, it's got like little fireworks that go off. Um, and it's like, congratulations, you found step nine or something like that. And it's a quick and easy way of testing that what you've done actually works. So if you don't have the resources to do full UX tree testing in-house, that is a great way that you can do testing using the tools that you already have at your disposal. So I think we're just about out of time. Uh, but thank you for listening to me ramble. Um, I appreciate it. I also really appreciate that I got to be here today, and that wouldn't have happened without the support of the folks who are contributing to the WCUS Travel Partners Fund. Um, I don't know if you've realized, but there's not as many women in tech as there are men. Um, and WordPress is doing an excellent job of improving diversity. Um, this particular program is doing an even better job of helping to make sure that people who are in areas that don't have stuff themselves can get in front of the rest of the WordPress community. Um, they did give me some sponsorship to get here today, so thank you. And if you are interested in helping other underrepresented folks get on stage, please scan the QR code and go and have a look at the Travel Partners program uh, for future flagship conferences. Thanks, everyone. And um, thank you. So I think we've got time for a few questions. Is there, do I have like a timekeeper somewhere that can tell me, do we have time for questions? Yes, we've got five minutes. Is that, yes? So there's some um, microphones around. If, if anyone has a question, please step up and hit me and I'll try and answer it. Hello, is it on? Okay. Yes. Great. Hello, thank you so much for the talk. Um, so. I don't have a ton of experience as a developer with databases and backends and all that, um, but I did learn about the relational database model and all of that, and then I came over to WordPress land and saw exactly what you described. Um, what are the limitations to the WordPress database? Do you, 
do you recommend implementing your own relational database in relation to it? I don't know, I'm just looking for guidance or some ideas that you have. Yeah, it's have a great question. Um, I think the biggest limitation in, in the WordPress database is that it doesn't store things in separate tables, but I also don't recommend storing things in separate tables in a lot of cases, because it's going to make WordPress do things you didn't expect it to do, uh, and it's going to take away a lot of the reasons we use it in the first place. Um, and like, I still use WordPress on a daily basis. Pods does have a function um, for being able to separate out your custom post types and store them in their own tables rather than storing them in post meta. It's one of the reasons that we love it so much. And particularly for sites that have a lot of content or we're doing complex queries. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at the, the um, efficiency of the, of the post meta table, but it's infinitely slower than if you have stuff stored in its own tables. So if you have content where you've got a lot of it or a lot of complex relationships, it's worth considering storing it outside in its own tables. Um, just make sure you have a strategy for how you do that and understand the best practices of database design. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. You said pods has a uh, functionality for allowing to store it in the separate tables and you should examine the use case to make sure that it makes sense for you, right? Yeah, yeah, like try and stick with vanilla WordPress if you can because you're gonna get all of the benefits of everything that WordPress does. Um, but if you're not, make sure that you are uh, taking that into account and understand the limitations and the flexibilities on that aspect of it as well. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Hi, yeah, my name is Jonathan. I wear <coughs> many different hats under the WordPress umbrella. But I was wondering if you've got any tips on how to wrangle the back end of WordPress, particularly the pages and all pages directories, um, how to organize those pages on the back end? That's a great question. Um, so as you might have figured out, we're firm believers in if you can put it in a custom post type or a custom taxonomy, you should. Um, so we try and separate out our content as much as possible to allow us to um, sort of like cross share information between different things. Um, and it gives you the flexibility of having like archive pages instead of a million pages. Uh, so that's one thing we do. Um, we, we heavily customize our dashboards um, in the WordPress backend um, so that they are easier to find the things. So all custom post types um, that are for a specific user type go together. Uh, we, use, we use admin menu editor is the plugin that we use for it for like ease of, because we've, we've got a person whose job is just to make sure everyone can always use stuff. Um, and her, uh, one of the things she does is she goes through as each user type and checks like, can I find the things that I need? Are they labeled in a way that I can understand? Because if your users are calling something news, but your creators are calling it posts, that's fine. Just call it posts on the back end, call it news on the front end, it doesn't matter. You can relabel what it's called in the admin dashboard. Um, but we definitely try and um, group our content and create sort of our own groups as it goes and keep all of the settings stuff down the bottom so it's content first and all of the scary admin things at the bottom. Um, in terms of pages, we create our own custom taxonomies for pages as well. Um, so we have, we have one that is on every website that we create, uh, which is page type. Um, and that is kind of designed to be a way of us easily identifying pages that are, um, say, going to require regular updating or maybe are, are like the customers going in and using the block editor and just they have complete 100% control over that page versus the home page, which is often sort of custom designed and so uses some kind of like custom field, almost form to, to create the content. So we use custom, po uh, custom taxonomies in that way to be able to easily navigate through our pages. So when we do have 100, we can just click like, you know, uh, d have, like design pages or something and then that will bring us up a list of those ones that use that particular type. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yep. Also, Admin Columns Pro is your friend. Um, it's a great little plugin that allows you to kind of extend on the, the default way of navigating through pages and posts and stuff like that inside WordPress. Great, thank you so much. 
Any other questions? I think everyone's bailed to get lunch. Is it a short question? Is it a short question? Maybe. You can ask it, and if it's going to take a long time, we can just talk about it at the front. Sounds yeah. good. So I also work for a nonprofit. We're about to under redo our entire website. How do you get people in our information architecture to stop thinking about an organization as an org chart and actually think about it in information groups? And how do you kind of just keep beating them down until they get that? Don't let those people in the room. They're usually the stakeholders. Um, no, I'm serious though. When we run with nonprofits, we ask them, like, what's your mission? Because every nonprofit has a mission. What's your mission? Who are the people that your mission is serving? Let's get them in a room. Uh, we facilitate, not them. Uh, so they are participating just like everyone else, but they get to hear that what other people are thinking and hearing and, and saying is very different from the way they think about their organization. It's 100% one of the biggest challenges that we have, and it really comes down to education and communication. And I'm, I wish I had a better answer for you than that, but I don't, sorry. I appreciate that, thank you. No problem, thanks everyone for coming along and sticking around for the questions.